it was the days of Jared that were marked by the whole creation of uh, angel human hybrids, whereas it was in the days of Noah that all flesh became corrupted, according to Genesis 6.12. And I show you how and why all flesh became corrupted, and it didn't have to do with angels mating with humans. It had to do with the creation of animal human hybrids, which I believe brought about the return of the Nephilim before the flood. And, and I, I would suggest that the creation of animal human hybrids does indeed qualify for n being a Nephilim. And I base that on the Hebrew uh, understanding of what a Nephilim is. And, and I show you from the Hebrew that a Nephilim, that we can think of it in, in a broader sense than the typically uh, more narrow view of a Nephilim being only exclusively the offspring of angels mating with humans. So if you just keep those, these three things in mind, there's no confirming scriptures or texts in the Hebrew writings that say there are multiple incursions, one. Two, the days of Jared were marked by the uh, cohabitation of angels mating with women. And three, it was in the days of Noah that men began to mix species, which brought about the return of the Nephilim before, and I believe it extended to after the flood. And that'll take us into this teaching, which is the return of the Nephilim now and in the future. Now, as we move forward, I really appreciate a concept that uh, L.A. Marzulli, how many of you know who L.A. Marzulli is? Yeah, a few of you? Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I, I've had L.A. on my radio show a few times. I've been on his show. I uh, spoke with him by phone a few times, but I finally got to meet him uh, several months ago in uh, Lubbock at a conference he was doing there and really got to spend some time with him and, and get to know him. And he came to Dallas as well, and some of you have heard about that. Uh, it was a, a really good time. He recently published a book called The Cosmic Chess Match, and uh, even before his book came out, I was seeing the same kind of thing that that book talks about as I was doing my research, that there appears to be this concept of uh, like a chess match, that, that God makes a move and the devil makes a move. God makes a move and the devil makes a move. And, and L.A. Uh, so well articulated that whole concept in his book, The Cosmic Chess Match. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that whole idea as, as we go forward in, in this teaching that, and show you that there is indeed a move and counter move going on uh, in uh, the various events of the 20th century especially, which I believe are leading to, may have already led to the return of the Nephilim now, as in our days today, uh, and will in the days ahead. Why is any of this important? I mean, why am I even talking about this stuff? I, I mean, I talk about this stuff, A, because I find it fascinating and I really enjoy it. <laughs> this stuff really, you know, gets me excited. But I, I also think it's really important to be talking about this stuff because very few people are. You're not going to find this in your average church. Churches aren't talking about this stuff. Yeah, there are other researchers out there, you know, Steve Quayle, Tom Horn, L.A. Marzulli. These are just a few uh, uh, of the few. There's not that many out there who are doing seminars and talking about this stuff on a regular basis. Why are we all talking about this stuff? It's because of that scripture. Jesus said the last days are going to be like the days of Noah. This is what's been going on in the days of Noah. And it's something I, I believe we re really do need to wrap our minds around and prepare ourselves spiritually because we might actually have to deal with some of it. Uh, it's, it's already happening now. Let's, uh, I'm going to take you back to the beginning of the 20th century. There's probably evidence of things that would uh, be beneficial for us to look at prior to the 20th century. But there's an awful lot in the 20th century, so for brevity's sake, I'm just going to kind of focus on a few things. Uh, there's an individual some of you may be aware of, Aleister Crowley, or Aleister Crowley. I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. Self-proclaimed occultist, called himself the beast, believed he was the beast. Very, very evil individual. Famed occultist Aleister Crowley was said to have had connections with Theosophist Ordo Templi Orientis and Golden Dawn, as well as with founder of Scientology L. Ron Hubbard. Those other, the, uh, those organizations are all occult organizations I just mentioned there. He had a major impact on a number of famous actors, artists, and music musicians throughout the 20th century and indeed today. Uh, there are a lot of artists out there that uh, really subscribe to this guy's philosophy. His, he wrote this book, uh, The Book of the Law. The, the primary commandment of this book is do what thou wilt. He shows up on album covers, like the Beatles have him on one of their album covers and stuff. A, a lot of people were heavily influenced by this individual and his writings. Uh, 
Uh, the book of the law was supposedly channeled from Horus, from Egyptian mythology, through his wife while they were uh, taking, having a little stay in Egypt. He's also the founder of Thelema. It's a, a philosophy he had. In January through March of 1918, Crowley began a series of magical, magical experiments called the Emelantra Workings, in which he is said to have opened a portal to another dimension, allowing an entity, or a demon, I believe, named Lamb to enter through it. Now, this is in the early 1900s, and we're talking 1918 here. This is the drawing that he made of the entity he called Lamb that supposedly came through an opening that he created in the fabric of time and space as a result of his occult sexual ritual magic that he was doing. Curiously enough, that looks very close to what we see on TV and the movies these days and in and, and documentaries that we call the greys. Could that be the beginning of when these entities started entering our culture? Could be. Uh, Eliezer Crowley had a profound impact on this individual here, Jack Parsons. Supposedly, Crowley's portal was further enlarged by Jet Propulsion Laboratory founder, okay, Jet, JPL, that's all tied into NASA and the space program. Uh, Jet, Propulsion, Jet Propulsion Laboratory founder and rocket fuel scientist Jack Parsons and Scientology and Dianetics founder L. Ron Hubbard in March of 1946 at a location that later became known as Area 51. Their experiment was called the Babylon Working. Like the Amalantra Working, it was based on ceremonial sex magic. Parsons desired to take the spirit of Babylon, the whore of Babylon that we read about in scripture, and invest it into a human being. The idea was to create a physical child and then call down the spiritual power and direct it into the woman's womb. When born, this child would incarnate the forces of Babylon, which they actually considered to be a good thing. Unlike Crowley, however, they were not as adept at opening and closing portals. Apparently, Crowley had the ability to, to channel and work with demonic entities and, and open up and close portals, but uh, apparently this one that these guys did, they reopened Crowley's portal, I guess, uh, but apparently it stayed open. And the modern UFO era began one year later, the same year Crowley died. 1947. So you have 1918, you got Crowley doing his Emelantra working. The first appearance of what appears to be a gray shows up. A few years later, his student, Jack Parsons and uh, L. Ron Hubbard, do this deal uh, in, in the early, in 1946. And then in 1947, we have the Roswell crash, which I spent a lot of time showing the connection between Roswell and Mount Hermon in the Ros Mount Hermon Roswell Connection DVD. And then, interestingly enough, so that's 46, 47. 47 also is when the Dead Sea Scrolls pop out. I think we have an example here of move and counter move. Devil's making a move. God says, oh, yeah? I'm going to tell everybody what's going on. Out pops the Dead Sea Scrolls and the books of Jubilees and Joshua and, you know, Enoch pop out and show us what the enemy's plan is. Show us who these creatures are, what they are, how they came to be. God is faithful to preserve his word. I'm not going to argue whether or not those things are canonized scripture or not. I'm not going to go there. They're not in the canon, fine. But God preserved them for us for such a time as this, even if they're just for historical value to help us understand what's going on in the canonized scripture. And then one year later, of course, Israel becomes a nation. Move, counter move, move, counter move. And that's at the tail end of the atrocities of the World War II. And I believe all of that six million Jews were sacrificed. Holocaust means burnt offering, basically. I believe the Holocaust was a, a blood ritual uh, that had sig very significant spiritual ramifications. They were doing something there to open up portals. And, and any, if you study the Nazis, you could, see, you could tell that's exactly what they were trying to do and trying to bring back the old gods, this whole Aryan nation thing they're trying to do. They were trying to backwards engineer the Nephilim. Why? What, what were they looking for? They were looking for blonde hair, blue eyes, which are recessive genes, by the way, and, trying to, and they thought these were you know, god characteristics. They were trying to backwards uh, engineer Nephilim, gods, the super race, the ubermensch. That's what they're trying to do. So, and all this starts off with Crowley and, uh, and, and of course, Jack Parsons comes at the tail end of World War II. A lot of things happening in that time period. And um, I, I'm going to pose the question, 
have the watchers been released? Remember I told you to remember 70 generations? Enoch chapter 10 says that they would be bound fast for 70 generations. Let's do some simple math here. Psalm 90 verse 10 defines a generation as 70 years, 80th by strength. Let's go with 70. Okay, 70 times 70 is what? 4,900 years. Well, 4,900 years from remember when I told you all that stuff came to an end? Roughly 3,000 B.C.? 4,900 years forward from 3,000 B.C. brings you to the beginning of the 1900s. How else are we to explain the massive explosion in technology and science and transportation and everything else that took place in the 20th century? I mean, we went from horse and buggy, literally, for 6,000 years to planes, trains, and automobiles and space shuttles supposedly landing on the moon. We're sending probes out to the farthest reaches of our solar system and beyond. We've sent probes past Pluto right? Leaving our solar system. We've got the Hubble Space Telescope looking to the farthest reaches, reaches of the universe. How did all that happen just in that short period of time when horse and buggy to all of a sudden, boom, wow, look at everything that's going on, to, I believe, fulfill what Daniel says in the last days, what's going to increase? Knowledge is going to increase and people are going to go travel to and fro. But interesting about that passage in Daniel, it, it, in Hebrew, it's the knowledge. There's the hey before the word, which means the. So the knowledge is also increasing. More and more people are out there getting revelation and understanding what's being told here. So move and counter move, right? Uh, so looking at the advances of the 20th century, I'm going to propose the idea that it appears that 70, year gen that 70 generation thing may have come to an end. Uh, and I'm going to show you a video because one of the things that advanced in the 20th century was nuclear technology. The explosion of the nuclear bomb, atom bombs, hydrogen bombs, messing with the atom, right? Watch this video and think about what's being, I put some text, in it. this is a video I found online. It was pretty long, but I significantly sped the video up. It's an animation somebody did showing 2,053 nuclear bombs going off in 53 years in the 20th century. I sped it up significantly and added some text for, the, for your benefit so you could see how I'm tying that into what we're talking about here this evening.
That's intense. What is that doing to our atmosphere? Well, did you see how many just went off in the Midwest of our country alone? Yeah. You know, two, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were used in warfare. Everything else is testing, right? And 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 and, 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 and posturing, you know, nations flexing their muscles. But there are a lot of physicists out there saying, you know, we could be tearing holes in the fabric of time and space with all this nuclear activity. 2053 nuclear bombs, atom bombs, hydrogen bombs going off in the last, in, in 53 years, from 1945 to 1998. Half of those, at least half, if not more than half, were our country blowing these things off. Is it just a coincidence that Roswell's in our country too? And Jack Parsons and Crowley? I'm just putting it out there, you know, I, just speculating, but how do we go to horse and buggy to that? It just so happens that we've got an ancient prophecy that says these guys are going to be released after 70 generations. It appears we're in that time frame. I'm just putting it out there as something to consider. Then you've got this. How many of you have ever seen this picture? Yeah, this is bizarre. This is the Pope sitting in front of a very large and disturbing sculpture that's called the Resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> the statue is called the Resurrection. It's located in, in the Vatican's Paul VI audience hall. It was sculpted by an artist named Fazzini in 1977. Fazzini explained that the statue shows Jesus rising from the crater of a nuclear bomb. I don't know about you, but that's not how Jesus resurrected, is, at least not in my Bible. <laughs> the statue is made from bronze. Kevin could probably give a whole seminar on bronze and its usage in the Bible. <laughs> and how it's related to Satan. It's very interesting things just surrounding that element alone, bronze. It measures 66 feet tall, 23 feet wide. I think we must ask the question, which resurrection are we talking about here? <laughs> I'm sure Jesus Christ's resurrection didn't look anything like that. Is this scene a foreshadowing of the false prophet, Petrus Romanus, as Tom Horn would say, some of you may be familiar with his work. He's got a, a new book out called Petrus Romanus. He's been doing the uh, interview circuit and seminar, doing seminars and a lot of radio interviews. It'd be worth it for you to get on Blog Talk or do a YouTube search or do a Google search on Petrus Romanus and Tom Horn's research uh, regarding the uh, prophecy of the popes and the next pope potentially being the false prophet. Looking at this picture and basing, based on the research that I've done uh, with the Babylon Rising series and the mythology and the coming great deception on who Nimrod is, Nimrod is the Antichrist. Nimrod is Apollo. Scripture tells us where the Antichrist comes from. Revelation 17, anybody know where the Antichrist comes from? The abyss. The abyss. Revelation 17 tells you the Antichrist, the beast of Revelation, comes out of the pit, the bottomless pit. Not Kenya, <laughs> not Hawaii, not the European Union, or the revived Roman Empire, or everything else that you always hear eschatology teachers saying. I'm like, did you guys even read the Bible? Because it tells you in Revelation 17 where the Antichrist comes from. The beast comes from the bottomless pit. Revelation 9-11 tells you exactly how, who comes out of the bottomless pit by name, Apollo. In mythology, Apollo is Nimrod. Revelation 9-11, there's an interesting number for you. Coming out of the bottomless pit. That looks more like the resurrection we're talking about here than anything we read about Jesus' resurrection. And he says this is Jesus coming out of a nuclear bomb crater? We got 2,053 nuclear bombs going off in 53 years. <laughs> Things that make you go, hmm. 